My name is David Silva. I'm the Assistant Director of the Evelyn Frank Legal Resources Program, formerly of Self-Help Community Services. Uh, as of April 1st, we are now part of New York Legal Assistance Group. The presentation today, as you know, is going to be about managed long-term care. So um, first, I'm just going to give a little overview um, of the, the landscape, the, the history, the different types of plans that you're going to have to start worrying about. And then we'll drill down to what's the big legal change that happened, which is, of course, that managed long-term care is becoming mandatory for anyone, uh, virtually anyone who needs home care. Um, and then at the end, we'll, we'll spend a lot of time going through the, um, you know, how you use managed long-term care, how you navigate, um, how does somebody apply, what happens to people who are already getting home care services, uh, what about when things go wrong. So um, to start out, uh, those of you who have been practicing for a long time may remember when there was just this thing called the Medicaid program, right? And you either had Medicaid or you didn't. You had a Medicaid card, and if you did have it, you could get home care. And you had to apply to get, in most cases, to get home care, you had to apply to the Department of Social Services, to the, the local district. Um, in, the, in New York City, you would apply to the CASA, and it was a prior approval service. So. Um, they would decide, the government, that is, would decide whether you get home care, how many hours you would get. They would pay the, the agency that provides the services directly. Um, well, then in the 90s, there started to be managed care under Medicaid. So this meant that, that the government was no longer paying directly for the services. They were, there was an intermediary, a middleman. Um, and this has been the case for the majority of Medicaid recipients in New York for years. Okay, most Medicaid applicants, when they get approved for Medicaid, the next thing that happens after they get that Medicaid card is they have to join a managed care plan. And from that point on, they have an, an HMO, private company, could be, you know, Affinity, Fidelis, Metro Plus, United Healthcare, and that's the only way they can access the vast majority of their Medicaid covered care and services. All right. But there were still some people who were exempt from that and still had fee for service Medicaid. In particular, if you're like me, serving mainly an elderly population, all the duals, dual eligibles, people with Medicare and Medicaid were exempt from managed care under the Medicaid program. So they could continue getting their Medicaid fee-for-service. And as you know, Medicare, there's such a thing as managed care under Medicare, but that remains voluntary. Nobody is required to get their Medicare health insurance through a private health plan. Um, so it means that dual eligibles, the, the population that we're probably serving, have been insulated from having to deal with managed care for a long time, while the rest of us have all been put into HMOs, right? So this is the first time that duals are going to have to deal with managed care as a compulsory matter, okay? And what we see now is this huge profusion of different types of plans that, are, that cater to dual eligibles in different ways. Okay, so one of the first things that's, that's going to be confusing for both our clients and ourselves is just figuring out what you're dealing with. When, a certain, when you encounter a certain plan, what species is it? Is this a plan that includes Medicare and Medicaid? Is it a plan that's just the Medicaid piece? Is it a plan that my client is even eligible to enroll in? Um, and what will the consequences be if the client enrolls in this plan? So we have to figure out a little bit of that. Um, the purple square here, managed long-term care, is one species of plan that we're going to be spending most of the time talking about today. But these other types of plans are all implicated as well. And there is a, still a small percentage of people who can still get fee-for-service Medicaid home care. Okay, But it's a, it's a minority. These are some of the different types of managed care plans 
Um, you know, as usual, there have to be lots of acronyms involved in this. So this is a little glossary for your, your acronyms. Um, you've got mainstream Medicaid managed care. Again, this has been mandatory for Medicaid onlys for a long time. And um, as part of the Medicaid redesign initiative, the, the handful of exemptions that existed for that population are now virtually gone. Um, there's only one or two exemptions left that a Medicaid, somebody who's Medicaid only could stay out of these mainstream plans. Historically, they, these did not include home care at all, but now they do. That was another change. So if you have any clients who are Medicaid only and they need home care, they have to get it through their plan. Okay? It used to be carved out that they could still go to CASA and get the home care fee for service even though their doctors and hospitals were through the plan. But that, that changed in 2011. So the Medicaid onlys, although probably a minority of your population, are going to have to go through their, their managed care plan to get home care. MLTC, when I use the term, MLTC is a, is a really frustrating term because it's used in a generic sense and a specific sense. The, the sort of generic MLTC encompasses any plan that provides Medicaid home care, but I'm going to try to stop using it that way because it's confusing. When I say MLTC for the rest of the training, what I mean is partially capitated MLTC. And I wish the state had come up with a better name for that, but that's what we're stuck with. Um, the reason why it's called partial capitation is because it doesn't affect your Medicare at all. It's just an HMO that handles your Medicaid long-term care benefits. So there's now, if, you, if somebody's in that plan, they kind of have this fragmentation between their, or the, the, it preserves the fragmentation that already existed between their Medicare health insurance and their Medicaid health insurance. So if you're in one of these MLTCs, whatever you were doing for Medicare stays the same. If you have original Medicare, no problem, stays the same. Medicare Advantage, that stays the same. You can stay in that plan. You could actually have two, two managed care plans. You could have a managed care plan for your Medicare and a different one for your Medicaid long-term care. This is what the majority of Medicaid recipients who need home care are going to have going forward. This is the majority plan. It's, it's um, the, the vast majority of, of plans are of this type and of enrollees are enrolled in this plan. Medicaid, the last three are, are all um, exceptions. I mean, these are all s smaller programs. There are a lot fewer plans and a lot fewer enrollees. Medicaid Advantage is like a marriage between a Medicare Advantage plan and a mainstream MMC. So it's for dual eligibles who don't need home care. If you needed home care, you'd have to be, in, and you wanted to have your Medicare and Medicaid combined, you would have to get it through a MAP or a PACE. So those are like a Medicare Advantage plan married to an MLTC. That might be one way of thinking about it. And we'll, I'll, I'll go into some more detail on those in a minute. So for those who learn visually, this may just make you more confused, but I was trying to think about the, the sort of, to map out these different plans and where they fall on the landscape. So you've got your Medicare benefits there. And by the way, for people who only have Medicare, Nothing has changed. All right, for your clients who have Medicare only, none of this stuff affects them. They can have original Medicare like they always could, or they can be in a Medicare Advantage plan. That remains a voluntary program. You know, it's totally up to them. And if you're in a Medicare Advantage plan, it doesn't pay for any Medicaid stuff. Right? That's an HMO that gets a check each month from Washington, D.C. to give you all your Medicare benefits but they don't get any checks from Albany. So they are not doing anything about your Medicaid. You might have, you can have Medicaid and be in a Medicare Advantage plan, but the plan doesn't touch your Medicaid. And then here's the world of Medicaid. 
and there's your mainstream MMC plans, which are just about Medicaid. Um, the, the difference with the mainstream plans is you can't be in one of those if you have Medicare. You cannot have Medicare and be in a mainstream MMC. You're excluded. You also can't be in a mainstream MMC if you have a spend down. So for Medicaid onlys who have a spend down, they're, they're in fee-for-service. They can't do this managed care plan. And again, it doesn't touch your Medicare benefits at all. And then and in the overlap there, you have Medicaid Advantage, which like I said is Medicare plus Medicaid in one plan, but it doesn't have any home care. So this bubble is all the Medicaid covered home care services. And you can see with mainstream plans, there is a little bit of home care in there now, because personal care assistance is a covered service. And there's PACE and MAP, these are the two, what I call the umbrella policies, where everything for a dual eligible could possibly get, they have to get through that plan. It's at the intersection of all three of those domains. And what it means is if somebody enrolls in a PACE or a MAP to access Medicaid home care, it means they might also have to change what doctors and hospitals they go to. Because when you're in a managed care plan, you have to stay in network. You have to go to providers who accept that plan's um, reimbursement, who have a contract with that plan. And so this does not leave your Medicare alone. Yes? Mm -hmm. The question was, I would said before that you can't have the MMC and Medicare, original Medicare or Medicare Advantage. If you have any kind of Medicare, you can't be in an MMC. That's right, you're excluded. And then finally, there's little old partial cap MLTC. And, and what I was trying to illustrate here is it's just about your Medicaid home care. It's not even about your other Medicaid stuff, right? I mean, Medicaid covers a lot of other things besides home care. For somebody, even with somebody with Medicare as their primary insurance, Medicaid would cover the out-of-pocket costs of original Medicare, right? So when you go to the doctor and there's a 20% coinsurance, Medicaid picks that up. If you go to the hospital and you have uh, the Part A deductible of $1,100, Medicaid picks that up. Um, there are certain services that Medicare doesn't cover that Medicaid would be primary for. So someone who's in one of these MLTCs still has fee-for-service Medicaid for some things. All right? They only have managed Medicaid for their home care. And dental, vision, hearing, podiatry. As usual, there are exceptions to the exceptions, but um, the, the bulk of what you're getting in that benefit package is just Medicaid long-term care services. Okay? And of course, it, it's, it, it doesn't overlap with your Medicare benefit at all. It leaves your Medicare completely untouched. So the way I think is, you know, in dealing with my clients who have now avoided the managed care revolution in health insurance for over two decades, all right, and now this is being thrust upon them, and all they've ever had is original Medicare, and maybe they had fee-for-service Medicaid, and they have to start dealing with an HMO all of a sudden, most of them say, I want the least amount of change possible, okay? Just, you know, if I have to have an HMO for my, man for my home care, fine, I have no choice. But leave everything else alone, please, right? That, that's how my, my clients are very averse to change, and I don't blame them. So, so if that's your approach, stay away from the pace and the map, right? Because if you go into the pace and the map, it means you're really upending the whole apple cart of their, of their health care. They have to make sure their doctors are in network, their hospitals are in network, that their pharmacy accepts the plan, you know, that the outpatient clinic accepts the plan, everything. If you go into a partial cap MLTC, it leaves well enough alone in, your, in, in the Medicare world, and it means it's just going to be a change for them in how they get their home care. So what makes it 
managed long-term care, Medicaid managed long-term care. Obviously, it's Medicaid. Um, you have to be approved for Medicaid to have MLTC. And it's community Medicaid, right? You don't need to do a five-year look back. It's not, it's not institutional. It's community Medicaid. So you have to be found resource eligible as of the month of application. You have to document your resources. If you attest to your resources, you can't enroll in an MLTC. Uh, you would have to upgrade your coverage first. Um, and you can do spend down. Just like you could do spend down under regular community Medicaid, you can do spend down with MLTC. Okay? The managed care piece of it, I mean, we usually just throw this term around without really defining it, but to me what makes something managed care, and you'll see why this matters later, is that it's a private health insurance company that gets paid a fixed amount per capita. Per, they call it a per member per month. So the state of New York pays each plan a fixed amount that's the same for all their members each month. Okay, to provide them all covered services. So the state says these are all the services that are in your benefit package. If any of these members need them, you have to give them to them. And the eligibility standards are the same for those services as they were under regular Medicaid. But we're not, the state isn't getting involved in deciding what you give to whom and how much you give to whom. And we're not paying you more to give them more care and we're not paying you less to give them less care. We're paying you the same amount per member per month for every member. So this creates an incentive to find more cost-effective ways of caring for people. Or a cynic would say it creates an incentive for the plans to lowball everyone on the hours. Um, and it has the perception um, in government of making the program more cost-effective uh, and allowing the state to, to see budgetary savings. Another way that managed care plans keep down costs is through having a restricted provider network. So they're not going to just con contract with every provider out there. They want to negotiate cheap rates with, with providers so that they can control costs that way. Um, also, of course, just size. Uh, the, the more members the plan has, the more efficiencies of scale and they can bring costs down that way. Or the more members they have with a given provider. So, you know, plans might want to concentrate their services with one home care agency. Rather than having 20 different home care agencies they have to work with, they can probably cut costs by having them all through one agency. Um, and of course, utilization management. This is prior approval. Um, you know, different restrictions like that that allow the plan to, the, rather than the provider, the, the plan has a role in deciding how much care you get and what care you get when. And of course, the long-term care part we just talked about, it's just about long-term care services. That's, that's what MLTC is, right? And none of this is new. MLTC has been around for years. Even those other funny plans that nobody's ever heard of before have also been around for years. Uh, there just weren't that many people in them because it was voluntary. It was just one choice among many that a Medicaid applicant had in terms of how they get their home care. What changed in 2011 is as part of Medicaid redesign, the state said now it's mandatory for a certain subset of duals. So the affected population is dual eligibles, so you have to have Medicare and Medicaid, who are age 21 or older, who are receiving community-based long-term care for over 120 days in a calendar year. And the way they define community-based long-term care is if somebody's receiving any of these six services under fee-for-service Medicaid. So I call these the trigger services. Personal care, which in New York City is often called home attendant. Certified home health aid through a CHA. Adult day health care, which is also known as medical model adult day care. The Lombardi program, private duty nursing, or the consumer directed personal assistance program. So these are the triggers. If you're, if you're a dual eligible over 21 and you're getting any of those services, 
you are required to enroll in an MLTC plan if you want to keep getting home care. All right? And if you, if, if, now it's, right now it's not statewide yet. There's only certain counties that actually have enough managed care plans to allow them to force people into them. So right now it's New York City, Westchester, Nassau, and Suffolk. Those are the mandatory counties. So we're already at the stage now with implementation where people in this bucket have gotten notices. And if they haven't, they will be getting notices imminently for the, all those counties I just mentioned. Um, and for all of the services listed here. They started out in New York City with just personal care cases and then with consumer directed. Um, but now I think notices have begun going out to everybody and we have late breaking news that as of April 1st, the federal government has approved the state's request to basically end Lombardi and require all Lombardi recipients who meet these criteria to enroll in MLTC. So I don't have firm numbers on this, but I suspect the vast majority of Lombardi participants are dual eligibles over age 21, right? So I don't see how a Lombardi program is going to stay in business if they only have children and, and non-Medicare enrollees, right? If that's the only population that's left to them, I don't see that working for a long time. So I, I unfortunately think this means the death of Lombardi. Um, of course, the Lombardi programs had some options which were, you know, extremely unappealing, either to turn into MLTC plans, subcontract to MLTC plans, or apply to become this alternative care coordination model, which the state put in their uh, Medicaid redesign proposal, but which basically is an MLTC in all but name. So unless the Lombardi program had a few extra million dollars lying around to put in reserves, this was not really going to happen. So the people in that bucket, these, these mandatory people, have three choices. They're going to get a letter saying you have to pick some kind of managed care plan to get your home care, and these are the three choices they'll be given, an MLTC, a MAP, or a PACE. If they do nothing, they will be in an MLTC. The state will pick one for them at random. Nobody's going to be forced into a map or a pace, though, and that's good news because it means you're not going to lose your doctor. You're not going to have to reschedule your surgery just because you weren't paying attention to the notices that came in the mail. All right? Once you're in an MLTC, what happens? Okay, what services are covered? Well, it's a lot broader than those triggers, right? The six triggers were just home attendant, CHA, private duty nursing, adult day, CDPAP, and Lombardi, right? But the services that you can actually get through an MLTC are much broader and include some things that you couldn't get under regular Medicaid. It's actually, a, 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 on paper, it's an expansion of the benefits available to these folks. Obviously, personal care is included, consumer directed is included, home health aid, anything that you can get through a CHA, you can get through an MLTC. Private duty nursing is included. I know uh, at least a few plans that have been misinforming uh, members about this, but private duty nursing is a covered service. So it used to be if a Medicaid recipient needed private duty nursing, they had to find a nurse who accepted Medicaid, they had to submit a uh, complex prior approval to Albany, and it was very tough to get that approved. Um, now, you just have to call up your care manager at the plan. Say, we need private duty nursing. I think your odds of getting it are just as low, if not lower, but it's a little bit more accessible, and you know, you have, as with everything, you have um, opportunities to advocate and make that happen. And it's covered, the standards for coverage are the same, all right? Um, adult daycare, this is an example of an, of an expansion that has good and bad consequences. Social model adult day is part of the package. So if you had fee-for-service Medicaid, you could never have, you could never go to a social model adult day program and get Medicaid to pay for it because it's not a Medicaid-covered service. Only medical model is. 
but social model is covered under MLTC. So it really opens up the universe of possible programs that people could access. The, the downside is that now there are all these like pop-up social adult day programs coming out of the woodwork that don't really meet minimum certifications. They're not really providing any kind of, you know, adult day service. They're sort of like an auditorium with some bingo, you know, and, and, and then the plan gets $3,000 a month for that. So um, there's some controversy surrounding that, but I think the plans that are doing this the right way, um, you know, can, can be um, expanding people's access to that. Now, of course, sometimes they use it to substitute for eight hours, right? They say, well, we could give you eight hours a day of personal care, or we could bus you to our adult day program, and then we don't have to pay for as many hours of, of home attendance, right? So that's certainly uh, a possibility. Um, other things, you know, PERS, even meals are things that they're supposed to coordinate, meals on wheels, uh, medical equipment, supplies, etc. cetera. Uh, one thing that's counterintuitive, there are four medical specialties that are part of the benefit package that have nothing to do with home care, all right? So podiatry, audiology, dental, and optometry are in the benefit package. What that means is if you have a, a client who's in the affected population and they have a dentist they go to who takes Medicaid, all right, they will not be able to see that dentist anymore using their Medicaid card because when you, when you go into one of these partially capitated plans, it's almost like they're taking out the scissors and cutting a piece off your Medicaid card, right? Anything that's on this page is getting cut off your Medicaid card, and now your Medicaid card only works for everything else. And for this stuff, you have to use your GuildNet card, or your um, VNS Choice card, or your Ar uh, ArchCare card, right? So now you have to find out if your dentist takes GuildNet, all right? So if, they, if the dentist only takes fee-for-service Medicaid and not GuildNet, you can't go to that dentist anymore. Dennis says, what happens? I thought you had Medicaid. You say, I still have Medicaid. Dennis says, I still accept Medicaid. But you don't really have Medicaid coverage for dental anymore. You now have MLTC coverage for dental. Now, the plans all have to cover enough dentists that you could actually see a dentist, right? Um, and and the, the standards for coverage of dental work under Medicaid are identical under the plan as they were under fee-for-service. But it's just that now you have a network to worry about. And the same thing goes for podiatry, audiology, optometry. These are services that were always covered by Medicaid, but I think were difficult to access for some people. Um, I, I, I had a lot of clients who were private paying for these things, even though they didn't have to, because the Medicaid benefit was difficult to access or was you know, poor quality. So again, this might be an improvement. It might make it easier for people if they can just pick up the phone and call their care manager at the plan and say, hey, I need new eyeglasses. What do I do? You know? Uh, Non-emergency medical transportation. I have definitely some clients who were getting very sick of Accessoride, and uh, you know, this could be an improvement. The plan has to send someone to pick them up and bring them to their doctor's appointments. And weirdly, nursing home is covered. So if someone's in an MLTC, and they need nursing home placement, they have to go to a nursing home that accepts their plan, and the plan has to pay for it. Now, of course, the person has to get their Medicaid upgraded to institutional Medicaid, all right? So the plan can't pay for your nursing home stay unless you meet the five-year look back, looking for transfer penalties. You, you know, you'll have potentially chronic care budgeting, just as you would uh, under regular institutional Medicaid. The difference is just that you're accessing that benefit through your plan, and you have to do it through your plan's network. So this package of services is just for the partial plans. If you're in MAP or PACE, it's all of this stuff plus everything else. If you're in MAP or PACE, it also includes your doctors, your hospitals, your drugs, etc. So a, a brief word on nursing home. Um, generally, if 
now that you're in an MLTC plan, if you need nursing home care, then the nursing home has to be in the plan's network. All right? But there's an exception to that. What if it's just a short-term rehab stay? So what if, for example, the client you know, fell and broke their hip, went into the hospital, and is now being discharged for short-term rehab at a nursing facility, Medicare is paying primary, right? Medicare would pay for uh, the first 20 days in full, and then days 21 to 100, subject to a daily co-payment of about 146 a day or something like that. What about everything else? What about, uh, you know, that last slide listed all the services that are in the benefit package. What about everything else? Doctors, specialists, acute care, hospital, inpatient, outpatient, labs, drugs. All of that stuff is out of the benefit package. It is carved out. Most of it is Medicare anyway. So that stuff stays as it was before, status quo. You'd use your original Medicare card, and maybe you have a Medigap policy also. Some people with Medicaid keep their Medigap, and that, that, that could pick up the 20%. Or maybe you have Medicare Advantage, and you would use that other HMO for your Medicare benefits to access your primary care. The only exception to that is audiology, dental, optometry, and podiatry. All right, if you're in, all right, so here's, let me show you just some examples of the different combinations that you might come up with. One of them is dual eligible with original Medicare and an MLTC. So they have a Medicare card. Original Medicare, they use their Part A and B for going to hospitals and doctors. And maybe they have a Part D plan, hopefully they have a Part D plan as well for their Medicare drug benefit, which as you know, dual eligibles have to use Medicare exclusively to, access, to get prescription drugs. If you're a dual eligible, Medicaid isn't paying for your prescription drugs. If you have Medicaid only, Medicaid is paying for your prescription drugs. But if you have Medicare, Medicaid won't touch them. You have to use your Part D plan. And maybe this person also has a Medigap. Like I said before, some people keep, the, keep those. They've also got their Medicaid card. And they can still use their Medicaid card for some things. They can use it for the stuff that Medicaid covers that isn't in the MLTC package. So um, I, it's hard to imagine something that would fall into that category because this person also has Medigap. So I can't really put my finger on something. Um, substance abuse treatment. I don't know. There, there, there might be something that would be covered by Medicaid but not Medicare and also not covered by MLTC. And then they have their MLTC card, which is for all the stuff we just talked about. So this person needs a bigger wallet, right? I mean, that's a lot of different cards to keep track of, um, but that is really how, how it would work. And um, you know, it, 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 I'm basically telling you I think this is the, the best option for most people simply because it leaves the rest of their coverage alone, but not because I think it's uh, a particularly clever way of accessing your benefits, right? Um, the, the whole thrust of Medicaid redesign for duals is about integration. The state ultimately wants to have care management for all, which means managed care for all, and they want everything under one plan. So next year, you guys will be coming to our training on FIDA, which is an acronym I'm not even going to introduce in this training, just to keep your heads from exploding. And FIDA is the state's plan to get dual eligibles all into something that looks like a map or a PACE, where everything is in one, one health insurance plan, and you don't have this fragmentation of five different cards, five different insurances covering different things. Um, example two is what if you had that person, same situation, but they're on a Medicare Advantage plan? Well, things are a little simpler, right? Here's their MediChoice Options Plus Medicare Advantage plan. So that's their Part A, their Part B, and their Part D all on one card. And then they have a Medicaid card, and then they have their MLTC card. 
So this is already a little simpler, right? Their Medicare benefits, they only need one card to access, and then they have this split between their Medicaid and their MLTC. And then here's the, the simplest of all. If you're in a Medicaid Advantage Plus or a PACE, you have one card. That's it. Everything is through that card. You actually still have a Medicaid card and a Medicare card. You just will never have a chance to use them because this card is your key to everything. One confusing thing about these Medicaid Advantage Plus plans is that in the Medicare world, they call themselves SNPs, Special Needs Plans, Dual SNPs or D-SNPs to be specific. So they will not call themselves Medicaid Advantage Plus when you're looking at their Medicare-related marketing material. And it can be quite confusing when, when you also will see SNPs that are not Medicaid Advantage Plus. You can have a SNP that's just a Medicare product that doesn't have any Medicaid component whatsoever, but it's targeted to dual eligibles. Okay? So this drives me crazy. It may drive you crazy too. I'm hoping that maybe at some point the state will start adopting a more consistent nomenclature, forcing these plans to really identify themselves by what, what they truly are. So the PACE and the MAP plans, I think of these as the big umbrella policy. Everything you could possibly be eligible to get under Medicare or Medicaid programs, you have to get through that plan, through that network. So this is an HMO that covers everything. Um, the PACE plans are more kind of provider-centric. They're usually based in a, at a particular site. And that when you go to that site, the doctors, the therapists, the aides, the nurses, the people who are taking care of you when you go to that site are probably employees of that organization. Right? They're not under con it's not like a traditional managed care thing where you have all these doctors are in a network. They contract with the plan, but they're not employed by the plan. In a PACE, it's more like they're employed by the plan. Um, the, whereas the Medicaid Advantage Plus is more like a traditional HMO thing where it's through contract. Um, here's a list of all the different uh, MLTC plans currently operating in New York City, sorted by number of enrollees. So right now there's about 78,000 people in MLTC plans in New York City. That's a huge jump from last year. So, you know, the, this shift of people from fee-for-service home care into MLTC has already happened. The, the, the bulk of that has already happened before anybody got a notice, before anyone was auto-assigned, because once the plans knew that there would be this mandatory policy, they became very aggressive about marketing to try to get a jump on market share. So you've seen that the, the players who've been around for a long time have already really bumped up their numbers. And further down the list, there's a whole second page here, a lot of newcomers to the field, um, some with you know, just, a, just a handful of members. So there's now something like 20 different plans um, for a New, York, uh, a New York City resident to choose from. And then here are the MAP and the PACE plans in New York City. Like I said, a lot fewer, but MAP is growing tremendously, and what you should expect to see over the next year or two is a shift in the direction of MAP, that more and more MAP plans will be opening up, that their numbers will be increasing, that they'll be marketing more um, aggressively, and that people that started out in MLTC find themselves in MAP. That's what the plans want, because then they can collect two checks a month, one from Albany and one from Washington, and it's what the state wants because of their, their integration goals. What about everybody else? We've just been talking a lot about duels who need home care. Um, there are a lot of other Medicaid recipients, right? Duels who are not receiving those trigger services our status quo, at least until about 2014, all right? And like I said, there's this eventual goal of full integration, so those folks should keep an eye out over the next year or two, but for now, they're being left alone. 
This includes some people who are getting home care, right? Because those six trigger services d didn't include every type of home care. There's the TBI waiver, the NHTD waiver, the OPWDD waiver. So those programs are being left alone. So those, those people are in this category, at least for now. And then, of course, Medicaid onlys, um, they've already had to go through this. Okay, they're already in managed care plans. Um, and there, there's, you know, a few scattered groups who remained exempt over the last few years who just got um, forced in uh, in the, sort of the end of 2012. So we're starting, seeing a little trickle of those cases, but most of those folks are already in the system. You see some of the same companies offering multiple types of plans, you know, multiple species of plans. And now is maybe a good time to switch over to um, the appendix that you guys should have. Um, and Valerie made some great lists of plans here to sort of illustrate this concept. This is on page three of the appendix. And I apologize when numbering the pages in the appendix, there are multiple page numbers floating around the bottom of those pages. The ones to look for with the table of contents are the ones in the bottom right corner. The ones in the, the center of the, of the bottom of the page are from a prior version. Um, so you can see here, the comp name of the company is on the far left side, and then the, um, then the, the, if, the, if that company operates an MLTC, a MAP, a PACE, or a Medicaid Advantage, those products are listed in the relevant uh, box if you go across from left to right. So, for example, let's look at Aetna. All right. Of these four types of plans, the only one that Aetna offers in New York is an MLTC, Aetna Better Health. Okay? So that's easy. All right, you know that if somebody has um, an Aetna Medicaid plan, that it must be the MLTC product. If somebody has Affinity, they can't get home care through Affinity, right? Because the only thing that Affinity offers is a Medicaid Advantage, and Medicaid Advantage doesn't have home care in it. Only Medicaid Advantage Plus has home care. So Affinity doesn't, they're completely out of the home care business. But Amerigroup, has an MLTC and a MAP. And the, the names of those two products are almost indistinguishable. So it's very important to know more than the name of the company in trying to figure out what somebody has or what somebody's trying to sell them. Um, and this is not even the full universe of possibilities. If somebody tells you, oh, I have United Healthcare, that could be a Medigap, a Medicare Advantage, a Part D plan, retiree coverage from a former employer. There's so many different things that could be. It's just not useful to know the name of the company. You have to see the card or see the, the summary of benefits or something like that to really know what you're dealing with. But from the consumer's perspective, this means, I think, that more and more people will get roped into MAP because MAP is a bigger monthly capitation for the company. They're going to be getting a Medicare payment and a Medicaid payment. The Medicaid component of that payment isn't risk adjusted, so um, it's kind of a secretive formula. I don't know how the state comes up with the formula, but it bears no relationship to the acuity of the members. With MLTC, a plan gets paid more on average if their members are, have, are more functionally impaired on average, right? So if a plan just tries to scoop up all of the really low-need people, thinking, okay, we'll pocket a lot of money, it shouldn't work because their average premium will get depressed if the average acuity of their members is low, whereas a plan that serves a higher acuity population will have a higher premium. All right. All, on average, again, member my member my member, they're getting the same premium, but overall they would get a higher premium. Uh, Medicaid Advantage Plus is not risk adjusted, so 
it's anybody's guess how the state decides how much to pay them. And I'm, I would just hazard a guess that they're getting overpaid. Um, so be on the lookout for that. If somebody wants BNS choice, make sure that that's what they get assessed for and that's what they enroll in, not VNS choice total or, you know, whatever they're calling it. So um, what's going to happen to people who are currently receiving Medicaid home care who are in the mandatory population? Here's the general timeline. The first thing they'll get is an announcement letter from New York State Department of Health saying, heads up, there are some changes on the way, um, and that notice is in your appendix. Lots of plan lists here. All right, here we go. So it's on. It's got a DOH letterhead, which is helpful. At least then the recipient knows that it's official. And it says important Medicaid notice. And this doesn't have any deadline on it. It just says you're getting, you're getting this because you receive home care and there's going to be a change in the next few months and you have to enroll in an MLTC. Okay? And then maybe a month or two later, they get this notice from an entity they've never heard of before. And the mailing probably will look a little bit too slick to trigger the client's perception that, oh, this is a government notice, right? Because if clients are on Medicaid, especially in New York City, the notices that you get are these impossible to read, lengthy, computer-generated notices, right? I mean, they just smack of, like, bureaucracy, you know, that uh, uh, some government worker spat this out of a computer, and, you know, it was mass mailed to everybody. And that maybe over years you've trained your client to actually save that and not throw it out and bring it to you, okay? So this kind of looks like junk mail. It's a little bit too slick. It looks like marketing materials, but it's because it's coming from a private company that the state contracted with to be the enrollment broker called Maximus. And they call themselves New York Medicaid Choice and this is the 60-day notice. Important, you must join a managed long-term care plan. And um, they give you a date. They give you a specific date on this notice, and that is your personal deadline. So there's no uniform deadline for everybody in a certain county receiving a certain service. You could have two people living next door to each other with different deadlines. So having this notice is really important and it gives you two months to plan which is almost enough time. Um, the, the client will receive a couple of reminder letters over that 60-day period. That's not the only notice they're going to get fortunately. And at the end of that period they'll get a notice saying this is the plan we've picked for you. All right? But it's random. They haven't checked to see whether that plan contracts with your home care agency whether that plan contracts with your dentist, it's just completely random. So it never makes sense to be randomly assigned. I think everybody who gets a letter should select a plan proactively. So once you get any of these types of correspondence, or even if you haven't gotten a notice yet, but you know that the client is in the mandatory population, they should start calling around. Have plans come out do a home visit, do the assessment, and find out what they're going to offer. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. If you, if you know that you're in the mandatory population, if you have providers that you care about keeping who are in the benefit package, yeah, you should definitely call those providers and ask them, do you accept GuildNet? Do you accept VNS? You know, what plans do you accept? Because that's going to be uh, a good way of narrowing down your options. All of a sudden, you don't have a list of 20 plans to choose from. You might only have a list of three. And the provider that most people care about the most is the home care agency, right? I mean, that's what this is about, is their home care. So 
the first call you want to make is to that home care agency and say, which plans do you contract with? Now, slightly confusing thing about that is that as of today, the answer technically is all of them because the plans are required to contract with any home care agency that's willing to accept the HRA rate through the end of 2013. So in theory at least, it doesn't matter which plan you sign up for, you will be able to keep your current agency and your current aid, but it might be temporary, okay? And my strategy with this is there are legal protections about transition and continuity, but the far better situation would be that you have a consensual relationship between the member and the plan, all right? And this is the courtship period. This is your chance to date some different plans and see which one you like, and then have a consensual relationship. And if the plan has chosen to contract with your home attendant agency, that bodes well for the, for the long-term stability of that relationship. If the plan and the home attendant agency are having a shotgun wedding because the state says you have to stay in a contract for the next year, the plan says, well, you're going to be the first one we drop as soon as January 2014 comes along. So I think it's, it's preferable if you find out what the vendor wants, what the home care agency wants, because they're not going to tell you, oh, we contract with every plan. No, nah, they're going to, they're, and they probably do contract with every plan. They're only going to tell you the two or three plans that give them a good rate. But that's probably good for the member, too. Um, and the other providers you want to check on, too. If there's that beloved podiatrist that the person can't live without, you got to check to see if they take, uh, take the plan, which plans, if any, they take. If the person is interested in doing MAP or PACE, then you have a much bigger job here because you've got to talk to the primary doctor, the cardiologist, the neurologist, the endocrinologist, et cetera, et cetera. Find out which hospitals they work with. So that's, that's a very uh, convoluted process. I only recommend MAP or PACE for somebody who's already in a Medicare Advantage plan. So for example, I have a client in Queens who's in HIP, HIP VIP, which is now part of Emblem Health. And she's been in HIP for years. She loves it. She goes to a, a, a clinic where all the doctors there take HIP. And it's very convenient for her, and she's had no problems with it. Well, HIP, or Emblem Health, has a map. And I thought, well, this might be nice. Just keep it all in-house. Just take your HIP health insurance that you already have and tack on the Medicaid home care. And there might be some really good opportunities for coordination there. In theory, it should really improve health outcomes for the patient because the plan is at risk for everything. If the plan does a bad job, if they don't give you enough home care and you fall and break your hip, they have to pay for the hospital stay. They have to pay for the surgery. They have to pay for the rehab. So it behooves them to do good preventive care since they're on the hook for the acute costs. So in theory, I think MAP is a great idea. I just don't think most clients are up for a, uh, a health policy experiment, you know. But for someone who's already gone through that, ma that managed care process and they're in network anyway, why not? I think, that's a, I think that's a good first call for someone who's in a Medicare Advantage plan that has a MAP. Um, you can call, you can set up as many home visits as you want. There's no rule against shopping around um, and then you want to have selected a plan by you know by your deadline and you can enroll directly with the plan or you can enroll through New York Medicaid Choice. So this assessment visit becomes a very important thing. To enroll in an MLTC plan you do not need a form from your doctor. That means no more M11Qs. This is one one silver lining of the whole managed care prospect is that I can take all those M11Q forms lying around my office and just burn them. I'm so happy I never have to do another M11Q form again. The downside of that though is that there's no piece of paper going into the file representing the, the views of the applicant's treating physician. There's no paper trail of what does the, you know, the doctor that's seen this person for years 
What do they think about the person's functional impairments? That doesn't play any role in the assessment process. The assessment process is based on a 15-minute visit by an enrollment nurse who comes to the house, asks a few questions, looks you up and down once or twice, fills out a big checklist, and then, it, and then a computer spits out a number. I mean, they don't even have to think. They just, the computer tells them what number, and they say, okay, that's how many hours we'll give you. All right? So the irony is, even though it's such a computerized process, every plan comes up with a different number. Okay, so you can have one plan go in there and say, oh, we might give you four hours a day. And then the next plan comes in and says, sleep in. You know, it's all over the place. So don't take no for an answer. If a plan comes in and they don't give you enough hours, they don't give you the hours, the services that you want, or they say they can't take you at all, don't, don't waste your time with them. You know, these plans are competing for your client's business. All right? So... Shop around, get a good deal, and um, you know have some and ask tough questions. You know, I think it's very important to have someone else who's helping the client be there for that home visit, whether it's you or a family member. Um, you know, I I don't go to the home visits, but I coach the family member or the social worker um, on what questions to ask. You don't want it to come. You don't want it to be like an adversarial posture. Again, I like it to seem like a nice consensual relationship. It's always better if the plan comes up with it on their own rather than having a lawyer in the room kind of, uh, you know, coercing them. But you at least want to have a family member who seems really engaged and is paying attention. That some, there's eyes on the case and the plan isn't going to be able to pull a fast one without somebody noticing. Um, if, you want, if it's important to you to keep the same agency, keep the same aid, you want to make that clear during the home visit. You want to ask about what other services they're going to recommend. And never sign up until you have a written plan of care. All right? You have the right to get a written plan of care before you enroll in the plan. And you don't have to sign up right away. You can, you can review the paperwork with your family and get back to them about it. I think their, their policy is that they have to be there in person when you sign the enrollment agreement. So it means they're going to have to come back for a second home visit. So some of the plans get kind of put out about that, but that's too bad. Um, one thing that's really frustrating is almost all of the plans will insist that a family member or someone else sign a backup caregiver agreement. All right. So this is something where basically the family member says, um, if for some reason the home care worker doesn't show up one day, um, I'm going to drop whatever I'm doing and come to the client's house and provide personal care until the plan gets around to sending a replacement. All right, that's, that's what the, the backup caregiver agreement means. It's illegal. There's, there's, it's basically creating a an eligibility requirement for MLTC that doesn't exist in the law. It's saying if you live alone, you have no family who are able and willing to fill that role, then you are ineligible for MLTC enrollment. And that's simply not the case. All right? The fact is that the plan is legally responsible for making sure the aid shows up. They're getting paid. They don't stop getting paid if the aid doesn't show up. So they have to make sure the aid shows up. Now the problem is all the plans insist on this, and you sort of have to pick your battles. I mean, I think in the next couple of months we're going to get around to making an issue out of this with the state and saying, can you maybe tell the plans they can't ask for this anymore? But for now, the path of least resistance is just sign the darn thing, and then you can enroll. I mean, the plan isn't going to be able to sue the adult child for not, you know, for not following through on the backup caregiver agreement. Um, so I think there's, there's really no recourse for, for, for signing it. But if, it's a, you know, if you have a client who doesn't have a family member who can sign a backup care, caregiver agreement and the plan basically says, well, we're not going to enroll you, that's a major problem. That's illegal and, and you should report it to the state. And I'll give you the contact information to do that later. 
I wouldn't waste too much time with it. Just take your business elsewhere. If you can find another plan that isn't going to do that, that's, um, that's definitely your next option. So once you've picked a plan, you can enroll directly through the plan by signing that enrollment agreement, or you can actually just call New York Medicaid Choice, and they can put the enrollment through even without the plan agreeing to it. You can actually involuntarily enroll someone, um, not against the member's will. The member has it's always the member is the only one who decides whether to enroll, right? So if, if you hear about people getting enrolled, somebody ended up in an MLTC plan, either the member forgot that they signed up for it or somebody committed fraud. Because nobody, a home care agency can't sign you up for MLTC. A lawyer can't sign you up. A social worker can't sign you up. Only the member themselves, the Medicaid recipient, is the only one who can enroll into an MLTC plan. But the plan doesn't have to know about it. Because you can call New York Medicaid Choice and say, I want to be in um, Senior Health Partners. Even if Senior Health Partners has never seen you, never assessed you, never done anything, you will be a member of Senior Health Partners the first of the next month. And then But like I said, that's a shotgun wedding. It would be better if you have a, a meeting of the minds with the plan first. For Map and Pace, you actually have to enroll through the plan because it's not just a Medicaid enrollment transaction, it's also a Medicare Advantage plan that you're basically signing up for. So there's two sides to that that have to be coordinated. And remember, if you go into a MAP or a PACE, you're gonna, if you have a Medicare Advantage plan, you're going to lose it. If you have a standalone Part D plan, you're going to lose it. If you were in mainstream Medicaid managed care and now you just aged into Medicare, obviously you're going to lose that and you're going to lose your Medigap because you can't have a Medigap and be in a, a managed Medicare plan. Good news about enrollment is that there's no lock-in. So let's say somebody signs up for a plan or is auto-assigned to a plan and a couple months go by and they realize this is not working. I need, I need to switch plans. You can switch plans at any time you want, and it's effective either the first of the next month or the first of the following month. Um, but you can't go back to fee-for-service Medicaid. As long as you need one of those six, six trigger services, you have to be an MLTC to get them. So the only way you can go back to fee-for-service Medicaid is if you go into a nursing home, then you can go back to fee-for-service because nursing home isn't one of the triggers, right? It's only home care. Or if for some other reason you stop needing home care or you're getting home care from another source, then you can um, go back to fee-for-service Medicaid. Um, any enrollment transaction with MLTC has to be done by the 20th of the month in order to take effect the first of the next month. So you can never get a pickup date mid-month. And this, this definitely complicates things. Um, and with disenrollment, it can be dragged out even longer. Uh, the good news is if you're, as we're talking about now mainly, clients who are already in service, clients who are getting personal care or CHA or what have you, um, it's not that their personal care services stop April 30th and then they have no care for the month of May, and then the MLTC starts June 1st, okay? They will get their CASA services continuing all the way up through their MLTC pickup date, okay? So, for example, let's say your client got a 60-day notice saying you have to pick a plan by, um, by April 22nd, all right? So the consumer finally picks a plan on April 22nd, wait until the last minute, and uh, they, the enrollment form goes in on April 22nd, it's not going to take effect May 1st because it's after the 20th. So it's not going to say you have to get it in before the 20th. So instead, it'll be June 1st. Now the notice says 
you have to pick a plan by April 22nd, somebody might think, oh, that means I'm, my home care services are going to stop on April 22nd. It doesn't. Your services will continue even though you, you had to make your selection by April 22nd, the, the sort of termination date of your existing home care is the same as the pickup date for your MLTC. So if you have a June 1st enrollment, your CASA services will continue right through. For these people who are in the mandatory bucket, right, so they're duals over age 21, they're receiving community-based long-term care for more than 120 days, they get their 60-day notice, they have to enroll in an MLTC, a MAP, or a PACE, they're already getting home care. And so they're transitioning from getting fee-for-service home care through CASA or a CHA or private duty nursing or Lombardi. And they're transitioning into receiving services through an MLTC plan. So there are certain rules of engagement about how that transition is supposed to work. And there are some provisions here to protect beneficiaries from losing services during that transition. The first and most important is the 60-day transition requirement. This was a condition that CMS imposed, the federal government. The state wasn't going to do this. Okay, the state had a much weaker transition policy that was uh, similar to what they do for mainstream managed care um, and would basically allow the plan to reduce or discontinue your services almost immediately after you enrolled. Okay, if that's what they wanted to do. Um, but this is much stronger. It says that they have to continue your previous type and level of services for a minimum of 60 days. So even if they get around to assessing you earlier than 60 days, they can't effectuate their new determination until day 61. So there's two different ways that this could play out, right? The, the preferred approach is that you've shopped around during your, your, 60, your first 60-day period. Somebody reminded me the other day, there's two different 60 days here. The 60 days that you got on the notice from New York Medicaid Choice in which, to, in which to pick a plan. So you're shopping around, you're testing out different plans, and, and one comes up that you like, they're willing to give you the same hours you got before, they're willing to keep the same aid, they're going to give you other services you like, and you say, great, the nurse was so nice, I'm going to sign up for them. You sign an, an enrollment agreement, agreeing to that plan of care. All right? You don't have to worry about this. Right? You don't have to worry. You have a contract, basically, and you're protected. They have to adhere to that plan of care through the end of that authorization period, and you don't have to worry about the 60-day transition policy. All right? Now, of course, if they do a bait and switch and they break their word and they said they were going to give you 12 by 7 and then lo and behold, they only give you 8 by 7, well, you have major, you know, you have a major claim against them and at the very least, you're protected by this. But even if, let's say it was an increase, let's say the plan, you were getting 8 by 7 at CASA, plan assesses you and says, we're going to give you 10 by 7, we're going to give you more, you enroll based on that representation that you got in writing and they do a bait and switch and they say no 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 we're only going to give you six by seven well this means that you at least get the eight by seven you should definitely get the ten by seven because that's what they said they were going to give you and you would have an appeal you would have an opportunity to appeal that and I would definitely complain to the Department of Health if a plan does that I haven't heard of that yet but the second scenario is where you didn't get that consensual relationship. You couldn't find a plan that you wanted to sign up for. No plan was willing to give you the hours you wanted. Okay? And an example I might give of this is what if you're getting split shift from CASA? All right? No plan is going to offer you split shift. I can tell you right away. Unless you have a special relationship with a plan and you have somebody there that you can really sweet talk, it's going to be really hard to get a plan to say, yes, we're going to give you split shift based on that, that nurse's assessment. All right? They all say, we don't give split shift. And it's not true because they all give split shift. 
but they hate doing it so much that they really try to make it seem like something that nobody can get. And your, your 60 days are running out. You have to enroll in a plan. And, and I mean, I'm, I'm not saying go through all 20 plans before you get to this point, but at a certain point you're going to say, all right, enough is enough. I have to pick a plan. You might have to enroll blind, do, a, do what I call a blind enrollment, where this means that you're calling up Maximus and you're telling them, sign me up for GuildNet. Okay, I'm at day 58, I'm running out of time, GuildNet said it's going to take them two weeks to come out and do an assessment, I don't have time, or, you know, a bunch of plans came out and assessed me, none of them said they'd give me split shift, but GuildNet was the best of the worst, so, all right, let's do GuildNet, and you never signed an agreement, okay, but New York Medicaid Choice can get you enrolled in that plan. So it's a blind enrollment, and on the effective date of that enrollment, GuildNet becomes responsible for paying for your home care, and they have to continue your split shift for 60 days. Same home care agency. The only thing that changes is who's writing the checks. So instead of New York City paying the home care agency, GuildNet starts paying the home care agency, and it should be seamless for the client. Now, at the end of the 60 days, of course, the plan is going to go out and assess, and they're probably going to say the same thing they said before, if they, if they had ever come out before, say, no, we're not going to give you split shift. So maybe they say, we're going to reduce you to 12 by 7. Day 61, or towards the end, actually, 10, day 50, you should get a notice from them saying, in 10 days, we're going to reduce your services to 12 by 7. You have the right to request an internal appeal. You have the right to request a fair hearing. You have the right to aid continuing. And then you can appeal it, all right? And that's a reduction. But you've got 60 days under your belt of the plan giving you split shift. You can build a record, all right? You can find out what the aide was doing at night. Was the aide sitting around twiddling their thumbs? Were they sleeping? No, they were turning and positioning you every two hours. They were taking you to the bathroom. They were changing your diaper. Whatever it was they were doing, then you can use that to prove why you still need split shift. So the ball is in, in the plans court at that point to prove that you don't need split shift, to prove that the CASA was committing fraud, to prove that you got better, that a miracle happened, and you suddenly became independent of toileting. The other really important protection is continuity of care. So this means that, as I said before, all the plans are required to contract with all of the home care agencies that are willing to accept the HRA rate. And this was extended all the way through the end of, December, the end of 2013, and it was expanded. It used to only be New York City. It was expanded to include uh, Nassau, Suffolk, and Westchester. So any man, all the mandatory counties, it applies um, through the end of 2013. All right. Um, so it's a little insurance policy. If if a member, if a if a client didn't go through this process of checking with the LICSA and see if they see if they take the particular plan, see which plans they work with, uh, if they didn't pay attention to the 60-day notice, if they get auto assigned, whatever you know bumps in the road happen, at the very least, the member should be able to keep the same number of hours for 60 days and keep the same agency through the end of 2013. All right, so after that 60 days, if the plan wants to reduce your services, they have to give you a notice, a notice of action. And later on, we'll talk about what constitutes an action. What are the things the plan has to give you written notice of? What does the notice have to say? But at this point, we'll just say, you have the right to appeal, you get aid continuing, and your first step is not a fair hearing. Your first step is something called an internal appeal that you do with the plan. Aid continuing is one thing that works a little bit differently with MLTC than under traditional home care. Aid continuing is super important because this is 
what enables you to litigate your disputes with the plan over the medical necessity of Medicaid covered services, it lets you litigate those disputes on the plan's dime or on the state's dime. So if the plan says they want to give you less than what you're getting now or they want to discontinue what you're getting now, they have to keep giving you the same services until after that dispute is adjudicated. And this is a, this is a requirement of constitutional magnitude. It's about a, a pre-termination hearing. It's because you have a due process right to have the, your continued entitlement until there's been an adjudication that you're not entitled to it. All right? It can't be cut the hours first, ask questions later. Um, so that's the way it's always worked, but with managed care, there's a, an exception to this in federal regulations that says that aid continuing is only required until the end of the authorization period. The authorization period is a, a date arbitrarily set by the plan. So if the plan says they, you know, you, they enroll you, they say, sure, we'll give you split shift, no problem, or, they, uh, or you, you're you know, auto-assigned and they continue your prior services and they say, all right, we're putting you up for 60 days of split shift. So your authorization, let's say you're effective May 1st, your, your authorization period ends June 30th. So on June 20th, you get a notice from them saying, in 10 days, we're reducing your services to eight hours a day. You have the right to appeal and you have the right to aid continuing. For the transition period, only for the transition period, at the, you get aid continuing not just until June 30th, but you get it all the way until you get a fair hearing decision. So you do your internal appeal. That takes a couple weeks. You keep getting your split shift. You lose the internal appeal. You request a fair hearing. That takes months. You keep getting split shift. Finally, your fair hearing gets scheduled. You keep getting split shift. And then a month later, you get an unfavorable decision on the fair hearing saying, no, you don't need split shift. Only then can they go ahead and reduce your services as they pr proposed to do all the way back in May. Okay? That's the way it works for, these, for, for, for reductions immediately after the transition period. But what about further down the road? Let's say they don't do that. They say, okay, we'll keep giving you split shift. They reauthorize you for another six months. So from July 1st through um, January um, of 2014, you keep getting split shift. And then December 20th, you get a notice saying on January 1st, we're going to reduce you to 8 by 7. Um, well, your authorization period expires December 31st. So you request an appeal, you get aid continuing, but you only get aid continuing until December 31st. And then on January 1st, they can go ahead with the reduction, even though you probably haven't even had your internal appeal yet, much less your fair hearing. You've got a couple months to go before you get a final adjudication of the correctness of that determination, and they get to drop your services in the meantime. So now you're only getting eight hours a day when you need split shift. What are you supposed to do about the difference? You're a Medicaid recipient. Are you private paying to supplement the hours that the plan is giving you? Probably not, right? So this is, this is an issue of, of really constitutional magnitude. I can guarantee you there will be litigation on this. The, the real problem for us is that it's not a state problem. It's a federal problem. There's a federal regulation that, that says that a Medicaid managed care plan that your aid continuing ends at the end of the authorization period. So we're really going to have to challenge that. But at least for that 60-day transition, it, there's a little, you know, it's still the old rules for that period. And in the appendix, one of the things in here is the special terms and conditions, let's see, which is the, yeah, here we go. An excerpt from the Special Terms and Conditions at page 33. Um, this was when CMS approved the state's proposal to mandate this population to MLTC. Um, 
they put these, you know, they, they attach these conditions to it, and um, part of it is that there would be, um, let's see which page that's on. Oh, here we go. Transition of care period. On um, page 17, um, it explains the, the transition of care period, pre-existing service plan for 60 days. Any reduction shall trigger the required notice under section 438.404 including the right to file an appeal um, and the right to have authorized service continue pending the appeal. All right, so that's good news. So one thing that's um, going to be different for the, this population that was already receiving CASA or CHA and is now going into MLTC is spend down. Because there were a lot of people in, in CASA or CHA who couldn't afford to pay their spend down, and they just didn't. Or they paid a portion of their spend down, but they couldn't afford to live on $800 a month. Right? They just couldn't. Well, that's going to become a problem when they go into MLTC. Because an MLTC plan may disenroll you for failure to pay the spend down. So whereas before, let's say the client has a $400 a month spend down, they would get a bill every month from the home care agency for $400 a month. And if they didn't pay it, there was nothing the agency could do about it, right? They couldn't cut off their Medicaid. They couldn't cut off their home care. The only thing they could do was sue the home care recipient. And that rarely happened because they knew that the home care recipient was probably judgment proof. The MLTC plan, on the other hand, can disenroll you for non-payment of your spend down. Now, they have to give you a notice first. Okay, they have to give you a written demand saying, all right, you haven't been paying your spend down for the last few months. We're going to disenroll you on the following date unless you pay up by then. Um, so this is going to be problematic for some people, but I think it's an opportunity to do pooled trusts for a lot of folks. Because if you have a pooled trust, you can get rid of your spend down and you don't have to worry that, the, that your MLTC plan is going to try to dump you. The other effect that spend down has on this is for new applicants. So it used to be, and we'll get to this in a second, that if you were someone coming newly into the system, you were applying for Medicaid and home care, you would go to CASA with both of those things, a Medicaid application and the M11Q, and the CASA would process both. And sure, you have a spend down, but that didn't affect the process in any way. They would, the CASA would say, well, we're going to be giving you home care services. So the cost of your home care services is greater than your spend down, so you'll just get a bill every month from the home care agency, and that's how you meet your spend down, by getting that bill. Whether you pay it or not is between you and the agency, but uh, for us, for Medicaid, we just need to know that you're incurring a cost. You're, you're incurring some expense towards the cost of your care by getting that bill each month. That's what makes you Medicaid eligible in spite of having excess income, all right? But with MLTC, this is now divided. The MLTC plan is not where you apply for Medicaid. They have nothing to do with your Medicaid eligibility. They're just providing the services. So you still have to apply to HRA for Medicaid, but you can't do it through CASA. You're applying through a different part of HRA. And they don't really know how you're going to meet your spend down. Okay, they don't know that you're going to get MLTC or you're just using it as supplemental coverage to your Medicare. They don't know why you want Medicaid. So one thing that we haven't really seen that much with our home care population is that technically when you apply for Medicaid with a spend down, if you have excess income, you're ineligible, right? You get a notice saying you've been approved for Medicaid, but really what's happened in the background is that your card doesn't work. It's not active, and if any Medicaid provider looks you up in their computer system, you're going to be a ghost. They won't even see a record for you, okay? Until you prove to Medicaid 
that you have medical expenses. So if somebody applies for Medicaid with you know, a $10,000 unpaid hospital bill, then great. You know, I mean, not great that you have a $10,000 unpaid hospital bill, but, but great that you have medical expenses you can use to meet your spend down, because then they can activate your card. All right? If you've got active coverage, great. Any plan can enroll you if you have active coverage. But if, you have, if you've been approved with a spend down and you didn't submit any medical bills, you have no coverage. Your Medicaid is inactive. And until it becomes activated, no MLTC plan can enroll you because they think you don't have Medicaid yet. So one step towards solving that problem, and it gets even worse, believe it or not, is requesting what's called provisional Medicaid when you apply. It's a code 06 that, net, that needs to get put in to, your, to the Medicaid system. And you would need to tell HRA that the reason you're applying for Medicaid is to enroll in an MLTC. And that way they will understand, okay, the MLTC services is how you're going to meet your spend down. That's the medical expense that we'll use to activate your coverage. That still doesn't solve the problem. You're still going to have other issues with getting enrolled, which we'll talk about later. But that's one thing you've got to make sure to do for those people who have a spend down. So how do you apply if you're not, you know, we've been talking mostly now about the people who are already in the system. What about people who are new to the system? Well, CASA is closed. All right? If you're in the mandatory population, you can't go through CASA anymore. There are still some exempt people who can go through CASA. All right, we'll talk about them a little bit later, but they're the minority. Any new applicant for PCA, CDPAP, long-term CHA, private duty nursing, or adult day health care are being redirected to enroll in MLTC plans. And Lombardi uh, is about to be the case as well. Uh, so there, there was the federal approval to mandate all Lombardi, you know, affected Lombardi recipients into MLTC, but the, the state still has to issue guidance on that. So technically, I think as of today, you could still enroll directly with the Lombardi program. I just don't think it makes sense because in a few weeks you'll probably be required to go into MLTC anyway. So for all intents and purposes, the door to Lombardi is also closed. Um, so if you're not exempt from MLTC for some reason, how do you apply for home care if you already have Medicaid? All right, let's say you already have community Medicaid, then you just have to call New York Medicaid Choice, select a plan, and enroll with them, okay? There's, there's no extra transaction you have to do with Medicaid. You already have the right kind of Medicaid to enroll in a plan. But I see problems with this all the time. There's a step that the plans make you go through called conversion. And this is a term that's used very vaguely, um, but essentially what has to happen is if you're enrolling through the plan, the plan needs to submit a piece of paper to HRA telling them, we accept this case. And potentially upgrading or modifying your coverage if that needs to happen. So if you say, I already have Medicaid, and you come to the MLTC plan, they're going to look in ePACES, which is a computer system that pro Medicaid providers can use to check your coverage. And it gives them a very murky view of your Medicaid coverage. Unless they see exactly the codes they want to see in there, they might ask that, that Medicaid recipient to provide a new Supplement A and new bank statements and God knows what other documentation out of fear that the Medicaid case isn't the right type of Medicaid and that they have to go back to HRA and get you upgraded. If you know that the client has community Medicaid with community-based long-term care, if you know that they did the SUP-A, they, they proved their assets, okay, they're eligible for the right kind of Medicaid, they shouldn't have to go through that rigmarole. All right, it should be a very simple process. The plan just has to send one piece of paper to HRA, and it should take like a day for that to happen. If you're getting pushback, if you're seeing longer delays than that, contact HRA, complain to DOH. There's no excuse for that. 
And I, I'll bet you that you see that happening when you have cases where there's a high spend down or there's high hours. This is how plans avoid enrolling uh, undesirable members. By dragging their feet, it takes a month, it takes a second month, they hope that you'll go away. All right? So don't let them get away with that. If otherwise this is the plan that the person wants, then you know, make sure you push through that and get HRA to, you know, there, we can give you some contacts at HRA to help um, pull that process from the other side, you know. And we get a lot of these so-called coding issues where if somebody was in a nursing home two years ago, but there's still a nursing home code on their case, or they, have a, they were coming from Lombardi into MLTC and they still have the Lombardi code on their case. There are all these different things that the plans will refuse to enroll you if they see a certain code. So the problem is that there's, you know, a, a, there, there isn't any one responsible entity to fix that problem. HRA says it's the plan's fault. The plan says it's HRA's fault. So it's, you, you have to kind of work at it from both ends. Um, and, and, you know, figure out what the source of the problem is and, and really push on those. But there's, there's no good reason for that to be an obstacle. Um, an important point here is that the amount and standards for home care didn't change. That was something that was on the table in Medicaid redesign to restrict the amount of home care available in New York State, but they didn't. So the standards for who gets personal care and how much they get are identical to what they were under fee-for-service. So for those of you who have done a lot of uh, personal care, fair hearings, I'm sure you're familiar with Section 505.14, Title 18 of the NYCRR, that is binding on MLTC plans. Okay, not all of the procedural stuff, okay, not the M11Q, the nurse's assessment, the social assessment, the local medical director. The, the plan doesn't have to copy what CASA did exactly in their assessment process, but the substantive standards about total assistance versus partial assistance, uh, split shift versus sleep in, what types of assistance are permitted for a PCA to do, um, span of time, when is, it a lot, when is it permissible to do a task-based assessment, when does the plan have to consider the span of time over which tasks arise. All of that stuff still applies. But from talking to plans, you'd never know it, right? They have their own proprietary tasking tools that they use, their own checklist. And they, they don't know from Mayor V. Wing, Rodriguez, any of the, the major cases that have sort of sculpted the eligibility process for home care, the plans, it's not in their culture. They don't know about that. And each plan thinks that they are the divine oracle of home care assessment, that, that whatever their computer spits out is the only possible number of hours that you could be eligible for, and anything more than that is fraud. All right? So there's going to be a lot of culture shock as we try to educate them that, well, no, there is actually, you're, you're now delivering the Medicaid program, which, you know, has standards and rules and things that you're going to have to follow. And that includes the availability of 24-hour care, which you can understand why it would be something that plans don't want to get involved in. If a plan's getting paid $3,000 a month by the state to give you all the home care you need, and you need $10,000 a month of home care, <laughs> you know, they're losing $7,000 a month by giving you the care you need. So these are just some examples of some of the, um, some of the, the legal requirements governing home care, which do apply to MLTC, but you might run into some, some friction on. Um, the definition of whether somebody is self-directing is a common sticking point for plans. Um, it is a prerequisite of eligibility for home care that you either be self-directing 
or there be somebody else who can direct your care by proxy and that that somebody else has to be in substantial daily contact with you. Um, and there's an ADM that, that defines those terms and that's, that still applies to MLTC, but it's all in the, in the eye of the beholder, right? So where a particular case at CASA, maybe 10 years ago the client was self-directing and there wasn't a problem. And 10 years went by and they just kept reassessing and reauthorizing, but there was maybe a little drift and the client became less self-directing. And before you know it, the aide is really running the show, right? Maybe the aide's even administering medication, crushing pills, um, and there's no family members. You know, they're all, they're all in another state and they call once a month and nobody comes to the house and visits. And um, technically, that's not a permissible situation even under CASA, but it may have gone below radar for a while. Now the MLTC plan comes in and they see this situation and they're like, what? We can't do this. Nobody's, nobody's watching the shop. The aide's here alone with the client all the time, doing all this stuff the aide isn't supposed to do. We can't do this. So that would be a legitimate reason to deny the case. We've had this where we refer cases to plans and they say we can't take them under care because they don't meet one of the prerequisites to be eligible for home care. So this, this issue cuts both ways. Sometimes it means the plans are not giving enough care, and in some cases, they're right, and the CASA was, was doing something they shouldn't have been doing. And you have to get creative to find work, you know, workarounds to that. What if you have somebody who doesn't have Medicaid at all? They're starting from scratch. Well, first you have to apply for Medicaid. The process doesn't go in parallel anymore. It used to be that the CASA was doing your Medicaid application, which would take 45 days, and they were also doing the M11Q, the social assessment, the nurse's assessment, et cetera, and the processes ran in parallel, and hopefully they would finish up around the same time. So by the time your Medicaid was approved, they'd finish the assessment process for home care, and, you know, maybe two months out, you could start getting services, and it could be at any point in the month, right? It didn't have to be first of the month. Well, now, you've got a 45-day turnaround on your Medicaid application, and you can't even enroll in a plan until after you get a decision on the Medicaid application. So less of the process is overlapping. It's more of a sequential process now. Now, you can certainly get plans to come out and do home visits before you're approved for Medicaid. And I have heard a lot of cases of plans telling people, we can't even assess you until you have active Medicaid. That is not true. All right? That is a lie. And if you hear that, you should push back and complain to DOH. The plans definitely should be assessing people, even if they don't have Medicaid yet. You know, I think if there are Medicaid, that's a good question. Are they legally required to assess you if you don't have Medicaid yet? Um, that's a good point. I mean, um, if you don't even, if you're not even eligible for Medicaid, you know, if you're Medicare only and you have $100,000 in the bank, it's hard to say that a plan needs to come and waste their time doing a home visit when there's no way that they could ever enroll you. Um, but I think if you're a Medicaid applicant, I would argue that they do have to assess you. So maybe not before you apply for Medicaid, but once you've got the Medicaid application in and you've, and you've got that 45-day turnaround ticking away, yeah, the plans should definitely have to come out and assess you. And whether it's legally required or not, DOH has made it clear that they expect it. You know, a lot of the things that are frustrating about the move to managed care is, yes, there's lots of law and regulations governing these HMOs, but a lot of the details are in the contract. A lot of it's governed by contract, or by uh, these sort of informal policy directives that, that DOH issues to the plans. So for lawyers, it puts us in a sort of out of our comfort zone. We don't have like a statute we can say you're, break, you're violating. Instead, it's a provision of your contract. And at some point, we're probably going to run into the problem that our clients have no privity in that contract. <laughs> our clients are not a party to that contract. It's a contract between the state 
and the plan, and if the state doesn't want to enforce the contract, I don't know that we can make them. All right, but at least for now, I've had some luck using the contract provisions to guilt plans into doing what they should be doing. So you have a bunch of options about where you apply for Medicaid. You can, you can apply at any Medicaid office, basically, and um, once you're approved for Medicaid, that should be good enough to enroll in an MLTC plan. My advice, though, is go to this office, 785 Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn. That's the central Medicaid unit for the Home Care Services Program, and that's the, the, the organ of Medicaid that oversees MLTC. They understand MLTC. That's the office that processes the conversion requests from the plans. So I would send it certified mail to that address. And there's a phone number here you can call up to check in on it, you know, follow up on, on the process. That's also where you'll be submitting pooled trust packets if you're doing pooled trusts for MLTC members. And um, again, you need to ask for that provisional coverage so that you can, so that hopefully the spend down won't be an obstacle. Excuse me, those are the grant addresses just for New York City, each other. That's right, that's just for New York City. So for other counties, there's only one Medicaid office, right? I mean, you go to the DSS, like you always did, um, and you'd be applying for Medicaid with the DSS, and the part that you're leaving out is the physician's order, because there's no physician's order form for MLTC. It would just be a naked Medicaid application, and once you get a decision, then they can enroll in a plan. Now, New York Medicaid Choice is the enrollment broker for all the mandatory counties. So um, in terms of finding out about the different plans, uh, finding out whether your providers are in a plans network, um, you know, enrolling in a plan, if, you, if you're not doing it directly with the plan, you can do it through New York Medicaid Choice. They handle all of that. They, can, they counsel consumers who are calling with questions. Um, and I've actually found them to be pretty helpful. Um, they're, they're actually, the people who answer that line are actually pretty knowledgeable. Um, and if you have clients who are exempt or excluded from MLTC, that's where you submit your exemption form. Okay, there's not many people who are exempt. We'll talk about them in a sec, but um, they're the ones who handle that. And I have actually heard of people getting an extension of time for no reason, really. And I don't have, there's no legal basis for this. I don't know where they're coming up with it, but apparently if you call New York Medicaid Choice and you say, gosh, I'm at day 59, I haven't had a chance to pick a plan, or, I, or I've had a bunch of plans come out, none of them have agreed to give me enough hours, I need more time to review other plans, that they will sometimes give an extension, all right, and give you more time. Um, CHA is still an option, all right? CHA is not, the CHAs are not being wiped off the face of the earth, because CHA still exists as a Medicare-covered service, and as a short-term service under Medicaid. So if you need less than 120 days of CHA, you can still use fee-for-service Medicaid, and you don't need to be in any kind of plan. So for someone who needs to get home care ASAP, you don't have three months to kill for this whole, like, applying for Medicaid, and then enrolling in a plan, and then that might take until the first of the following month. You need home care now, all right? You can still do CHA Medicaid pending, if you can find a CHA that's willing to do Medicaid pending, which has become much more difficult. And that just means that the CHA is agreeing to give you free services on the assumption that your Medicaid application is actually going to get approved and that you can back bill for it. All right? Now, I know that in some counties, there's the possibility of having a LICSA provide services Medicaid pending. But you can't do that in New York City. So if you're working in New York City, you can't go to Elixa and think that they're going to be able to backbill Medicaid, because they can't. But in, I know in Nassau, I've been told that they, they are able to do that. So that might be an option for, for other counties. Oh, somebody asked me earlier, what if you've been private paying for home care? So it's not that you're, you don't have home care, you're, you have it, and you're probably hemorrhaging cash, or the family is, paying privately for home care while you're waiting for this MLTC thing to happen. 
how do you get reimbursed? Because as you know, Medicaid is retroactive up to three months before the month of application, if you were eligible for Medicaid in those three months. So you could, you, you know, under the old system, you could always private pay for services, and then once the Medicaid services start and you're approved, you can apply for Medicaid to reimburse you or reimburse the family member for the cost of private paying for home care, both during that three-month retro period and, in some cases, during the pendency of the application. Okay? You can still do that. That didn't change. You still have the right to do that if you're going into MLTC. The logistics are a little bit different. The way it works, at least in New York City, is that when you apply, for, you, you don't request reimbursement at the time you apply. You do it after you've been approved. You submit it to a different unit, and you have to submit, obviously, proof of the expenses you incurred. Um, but you also have to, have to have something from the plan showing how many hours you were accepted for. Because under the old system, that reimbursement unit could just look in their computer and see that CASA approved you for 12 by 7, right? So as long as you were private paying for 12 by 7 or less, then you should get more or less fully reimbursed, okay? Um, but if you were paying for 24-hour care and CASA only approved you for 12 by 7, you're only going to get reimbursed for 12 by 7, okay? So it's the same story with MLTC, but the reimbursement unit doesn't know how many hours the plan approved you for. And that's what your ceiling will be. So you get that written plan of care from the MLTC, and that's what you'll submit to the reimbursement unit. And that will be your ceiling. I don't know if you guys know about this. If you're looking for administrative directives um, from the state, there's a couple great websites for that. For recent ones, you can just go to the New York State Department of Health website and um, they have a uh, a section with hmm, I wonder if I can find it here they call it the library of official Medicaid documents yeah so this has uh, all of the GISs, ADMs, LCMs, etc uh, going back to the late 90s um, and uh, if you know what year and what type of directive you're looking for, you can probably find it here. And under the 2010 ADMs, I think we'll see the reimbursement. There we go. 10, 10 ADM 9, reimbursement of paid medical expenses. Um, another site that if you want to get a more comprehensive look is... Um, The Western New York Law Center Online Resource Center has a, this is at um, onlineresources.wnylc.net. Um, they have a, an agency directive section, and it's searchable by keyword, which is nice. And it also goes back even further to the, the early 90s and even the 80s, 70s. There's some real ancient ADMs in there. Right. Well, for the, the, the Western New York Law Center site, you can search by keywords because they've, even the ones that were scanned, they've actually typed in keywords. So, you know, you might have to play around with your search terms a little bit, but eventually you'll be able to find the directives you're looking for, even if they're from a long time ago. So I'm going to do reimbursement, and let's just see what comes up. So you see ADMs from 1990, and it covers a lot of different things with the term reimbursement, but um, it breaks, you know, breaks it down by year, and then I think you'll get some real... Um, yeah, here we go. Here's the one we were looking for from 2010. But then you can at least find out what's the most recent word on that topic. Okay, requesting additional or new services from MLTC plans. With CASA, you would just send an M11Q saying, give me more hours, 
right? With MLTCs, what you're asking for is a concurrent review. There's actually a name for it. It has special timelines. So a prior authorization is when you're asking for a new service, one that you didn't previous, previously get. So that might be your clients in MLTC, they're getting home care, and now they want to start getting diapers through the plan. Because maybe before they were just paying for diapers. They didn't know that that was a Medicaid covered thing. So now they want to start getting diapers and maybe some other supplies, chucks pads, stuff like that through the plan. They contact the plan and, and what they're asking, what they're basically doing is making a prior authorization request. And the plan has to respond to that within a certain time frame. If they're asking for more of a certain service, so they're already getting home care and they want more hours, that's a concurrent review. Um, and the plan has to turn it around no longer than 14, within 14 days of receipt of the request, um, or even within, ideally within three days of receipt of the necessary information. So it's a pretty tight turnaround on that. I and mean, this could be an improvement, right? If you were asking for an increase in hours from CASA, how long did that take? Right, like two months? So this is, this is uh, in theory, an improved timeline. The trick is making the plan understand that that's what you're doing. Because if you just call up the nurse care manager at the plan and say, give me more hours, I'm not sure that they're pushing the right button to invoke this process. So it's, we're still kind of experimenting with this, but maybe that's something you need to put in writing. And even though there's no requirement for a medical form, it wouldn't be a bad idea if you have a doctor's note that says, I'm recommending increased hours for my patient because of a worsening of their condition. They now, there's, you know, they, they've had a deterioration in their gait, they need more assistance with ambulation, they're left alone every, you know, from lunchtime through the evening. Um, you know, it's very, they're at grave fall risk every time they get themselves to the bathroom or go to eat dinner, get ready for bed, um, and explain why you think the increase is necessary. Um, and for all of these things that you can do with the plan, there's an expedited track and a standard track. So the expedited track gets you a quicker turnaround. You have to show that the patient's medical condition warrants a faster resolution. Appeals and grievances, I put, there's a lot of stuff in here about appeals and grievances. This works, there's a lot of rules on the federal and state level regarding um, appeals and grievances under managed care plans. Most of these authorities actually apply to all HMOs in New York State, not just Medicaid, okay? So it's kind of complicated. You've got two different types of complaining noises you can make with the plan. The first one is a grievance. And it's defined as when you're complaining about something other than an action. An action is a term of art, which I'll define in a minute. But essentially a grievance is like you didn't like the way the customer, you didn't like the way the care manager spoke to you on the phone, the aid that they sent was lazy, the, you know, the, the diapers that they've been sending you are not, are not, you know, are low quality, you had to wait a long time for the, the non-emergency transportation to show up. It's like sort of customer service complaints, but it's called a grievance. It's a formal thing that you're filing a grievance, and if you don't get a resolution you like on the grievance, you can actually appeal the grievance. But it's an, it's an appeal within the plan, and I wouldn't expect any great resolution of a grievance, okay? But it's good to know that there's a formal process if there's a client who has trouble with the aides, you know, that, that the, the plan is sending aides who are not up to snuff, um, you have a way of, of dealing with that. The more important process is the internal appeal. So this is where you're appealing an action by the plan. That would be if they denied a request for prior authorization, if they denied a request for concurrent authorization, if they're reducing your services, discontinuing your services, um, and, a, and a bunch of other things. It's an action affecting your benefits, 
that's an internal appeal. And there's also an external appeal. An external appeal is something before the New York State Department of Financial Services, which used to be the Department of Insurance. And this is something that anybody in this room who has health insurance, you already have, you actually have that right. Every time you get an explanation of benefits from your health insurance, one of those like 10 pages that they send you talks about doing this. If, if you're appealing a medical necessity determination by your health insurance in New York State, you have the right to go to that external appeal. If you're in one of these MLTC plans, you have to exhaust your internal appeal first. Now, I've never done an external appeal. I don't know how useful it is. All right? It's another tool that we have in our arsenal. It's something we should consider, but I'm not sure it would be my first choice because you also have the right to request a fair hearing. Now, the interesting thing is the model contract, oh, and also if you lose your external appeal, you can do a fair hearing as well. And if there's a conflict between the external appeal determination and the fair hearing determination, the fair hearing trumps. The interesting thing about fair hearings is the, the model contract for MLTC says you must exhaust the internal appeals. So you can't just get an adverse determination by the plan and go to a fair hearing like we used to do with CASA. No, you have to do the internal appeal first get turned down on the internal appeal, and then request your fair hearing. The problem is the only place where the state says that you have to exhaust is in the model contract. There was no statute, no regulation, no, not even a, one of these informal guidances, not even an ADM. It's just in the model contract. And the state has the right under federal law to decide whether to require exhaustion or not before a managed care member can invoke the state fair hearing process. So I have a question of whether did the state, can the state invoke that option only through the contract? Or do they have to do that through statute, through law? I don't know. We'll, I don't know. We'll have a lawsuit. <laughs> we'll let you know how it goes. But for now, as a practical matter, the state certainly believes that they've required exhaustion, so you should exhaust the internal appeals first. I'm not sure that means you have to wait until after you get a decision on the internal appeal to request the hearing. I think you can probably request the, you know, request the internal appeal, then request the hearing. By the time your hearing gets scheduled, you will have gotten the decision on the internal appeal. The, the important thing is... I, from my point of view, I want to be able to show the ALJ at the hearing, we got our ducks in a row. We, we did the internal appeal, we lost. Obviously, if you win the internal appeal, you can withdraw the fair hearing. And then, you, as usual, after the fair hearing, you always have the option of doing an Article 78, but that's really a last resort. So, when a plan wants to take an action, whether that's you know, denial, reduction, etc. They have to give you a notice of action. If it's a reduction or discontinuance, it has to be uh, at least 10 days before the intended change that they have to send it to you. So this is the same as under regular Medicaid. It has to, the notice has to include the action they're going to take, the reasons, the description of your appeal rights, and your right to aid continuing. And all of the require, there's requirements in the model contract in the regulations for managed care and the the regulations under part 358 of the the you know New York state regs for fair hearings all of those regulations that talk about when the agency issues a notice and the agency's obligations that applies to managed care plans there's a section in part 358 that says the term agency is actually defined as either the department of social services or whatever entity is making the decision. And in this case, it's the plan that's making the decision. So they have to give you timely and adequate notice, and it has to have all the requirements in under 358. And I know for a fact that most of the plan's notices don't. So you have, right off the bat, you have a way to, to, to win reduction and discontinuance hearings based simply on the lack of notice or defective notice. 
Well, when do they have to give you a notice? Well, when there's an action. It could be a denial or an inadequate authorization for a service, reduction, suspension, or termination of a service, um, failure to provide services in a timely manner. That's an action. So if you've requested an increase in services and the plan is dragging their feet and, and they've missed the deadline under prior authorizations, they've got, what was it, four, uh, 14 days for a prior authorization, and if they don't turn it around in 14 days, you can do an internal appeal. Failure to act upon grievances and appeals. So what if you make a grievance and they never get back to you about it? You can request an internal appeal and eventually get yourself to a fair hearing on that. So this just goes into the distinction between grievances and appeals, the kinds of things you want to do one versus the other four. And obviously grievances almost never get you to a fair hearing. I don't care about internal appeals. I don't think we're ever going to win an internal appeal. All right? The plan's just going to rubber stamp the decision that they already made. But um, I want to get to a fair hearing because then I have an independent decision maker who I can persuade that this, this plan didn't do the right thing. So a grievance doesn't get me there. So I always want to try to do an internal appeal if it applies. Um, and you can get the internal appeal expedited, which is good because it helps you get to your fair hearing faster. If you're just going to get a rubber stamp denial, you might as well get it sooner rather than later. So the time frame is first there's the action. You have 45 days to request the internal appeal, um, but if you want aid continuing, you have to do it by the effective date, which is going to be 10 days from the notice. Um, you can request the internal appeal um, orally or in, in writing, but I would say definitely do it in writing. All right? And then the plan has to send you an acknowledgment within 15 days. Um, the um, there can be a 14-day extension of these timelines at the request of either party. If it's expedited, it must be decided as fast as the member's condition requires, but no more than two business days from receipt of necessary information or three business days from receipt of the request. So that's unbelievably fast, right? Nobody ever got a fair hearing decision that fast. So the, the silver lining about internal appeals is even if we might be cynical about your odds of success, at least you get a quick decision. And even if it's not, even if it's a standard appeal, it's 30 days, which again is faster than any fair hearing. Um, and even the internal appeal has to be someone who wasn't involved in the initial determination who's reviewing it. So that's some comfort. At least it's, it's not the same person making the same decision all over again. Uh-huh. Oh, good question. Um, the internal appeal is not a hearing, so you don't have the opportunity to present in-person testimony and you know present witnesses in an internal appeal. It's just a paper review. Um, it does say that under the, the regs that the plan must provide a reasonable opportunity to present evidence and allegations of fact or law in person as well as in writing. So in theory, you do have the right to present that evidence in person, but I've just never seen that happen. Um, and I'm not sure that I would invest a lot of effort in, in, in litigating the internal appeal. I mean, I want there to be documentary evidence. You know, I'd want to get a doctor's note, or if I have, if I can, if I can conveniently produce documentary evidence very quickly, you want it to be on the record, you want to you know, make a record of it, but the, the goal with the internal appeal is get through it quickly. You know? And then at the fair hearing, the fair hearing is de novo. It always is. So you're not limited to the factual record that was before the plan. You can submit new medical evidence at the fair hearing. Judges will give you a hard time about it. The plans will object to it, but you have the right to do it, and the judge has to consider it. 
Yep, exactly. You have the right to request the evidence packet. So the, all the you know plan generated records that they relied on in making their determination, they still have to produce that. Um, and you also have the right for specifically identified documents. So you can go beyond what the plan is going to rely on, and you can ask for other things in the in the record. One tricky thing is in the transition context. Let's say it's a reduction. What we've always told people is in a reduction hearing, you want to see the before and the after. Because the only plausible ground for reducing somebody's services is that they got better, that there was an improvement, a change in condition. And the only way you can show a change is showing what was their condition before and what is it now. Well, the plan doesn't have any of the records about your before. They only have the records about now. So when you're requesting specifically identified documents, that request goes to CASA. So you have to get CASA to give you files about a case that they've disowned. You know, for all I know, they've chucked all the files. I mean, I, and we had a case like this just this week where we kept requesting over and over again, every different place, the Rivera unit, the CASA, trying to get the records from CASA, and they never produced them. And at the hearing, we said, we're entitled to this. And it was like the, you know, the judge thought we were speaking Greek. You know? He was like, but CASA is not a party to this hearing. I said, yeah, but the regulations give us the right to specifically identify documents, and the agency has to give them to us. Right, and they're the ones who have them. And the plan said, we asked for those same documents from the plan. The plan said, we don't have them. So, yeah. We did. <laughs> I requested it. I requested it. It was taken under advisement. Okay. We'll see. We talked about it continuing already. Um, so here's again the, um, sorry about that alarm going off out there. Here's the email address for the New York State Department of Health MLTC work group. That's a really important address to use when you have a case where everything goes to hell in a handbasket, right? When you have a case where the plan refuses to enroll them, uh, they, they, they violate the 60-day transition policy. Like any of these things that I've been talking about that are never supposed to happen but do happen, email the MLTC work group. The state needs to hear about it. A, they need to hear about it so that they know there are systemic problems that they need to fix, and B, they can actually fix your individual case. I've gotten very quick, resol very quick resolution from them, um, actually, uh, at that email address. There's also a complaint hotline for complaints about MLTC plans. Um, by all means, complain. And let us know, because we're constantly being asked by the state, by reporters, well, what's so bad about this MLTC thing? Give us horror stories. And the problem is that clients don't want to bite the hand that feeds them. If they're now enrolled in the plan and they had bad experiences, they don't want to rat out the plan to the state for fear that there will be reprisals against them. And that's probably a reasonable fear. So a lot of people are reluctant to you know, name names and things like that. But we really got to try or else nobody's going to believe us that there, there, there are issues. Um, I realize that we're out of time. I just want to really quickly go over that there are some ex ex people who are excluded from MLTC. This is pretty much it. Okay, These are the, the exclusions in the public health law of people who cannot enroll in MLTC. The biggest problem here is hospice. If you have a client who need, who's receiving hospice or who wants to receive hospice, they can't be in an MLTC plan and get hospice, even if it's Medicare-covered hospice. So if you need hospice, you can still go through CASA. You still do an M11Q. You can still get fee-for-service home care through CASA and get your hospice. The problem is if you're already in MLTC, it's going to take you two months to get out. And then the CASA has to do, process your M11Q. So you can start getting home care through CASA. So by the time you're out of the MLTC and into CASA, you're probably dead. So this is a really lousy 
system, and the state has promised us that they're working on a fix, but I haven't heard anything for a while. Um, these waivers, Lombardi waiver is not excluded anymore. If you're in Lombardi waiver, you've got to go into MLTC. But TBI waiver, NHTD, and OPWDD, those folks are still excluded. And interestingly, New York Medicaid Choice has an exclusion form which includes a couple things that weren't in the law. And one of them is any people with developmental disabilities, not just people in the waiver. So if you have a client who has developmental disabilities but is not enrolled in the OPWDD waiver, they can be excluded from MLTC. You just have to fill out this exclusion form, have the doctor sign it, and send it into New York Medicaid Choice, and they can stay with CASA or with a CHA and not be pushed into a plan. So if you're in one of those exempt categories, then you apply for home care the old way. You just have to make it really clear to the CASA why you're entitled to continue applying to them. Because their first reaction is going to be to just deny your application and send you to a plan. So you need to make it really clear on the M11Q why you have the right to still apply through the CASA for home care. Um, this goes through the other phases, other counties. Um, and then at the end of this, there's a, a lengthy section with different advocacy concerns, which I'm not going to go through now. Um, and then in the, in the appendix, I definitely want to just draw your attention to the model contract, um, which is here starting on page 47. And you can, it has the link for it on the, on the Department of Health website. This is the law governing MLTC plans. If it's in the statute, if it's in the regs, it's going to be somewhere in this contract, especially the section on, in Appendix K on appeals and grievances, um, and also the section on enrollment and disenrollment, has really strong language in there that you can use in your advocacy. All right? It's always great to be able to cite the contract when you, if you're complaining to the state, if you're complaining to a plan, to tell them this is the contract provision that you're violating right now. All right, well, um, are there any questions? Wrap up? All right, thank you all so much for sticking around. Make sure that you sign out.